the condition and principles of management. So I'm going to pick on you. Get ready. Okay, so uh, this is the x-ray of a 72-year-old lady who uh, had a fall at home on the stairs. 12 steps, landed onto her right side, and she presents to ED. Uh, yeah, uh, <coughs> um, okay, so, um, that hand stairs, sorry? 12, 12. 12 stairs, so obviously I've seen ED, I've uh, taken an ATF protocol, she's fallen from height, assess her, top of the toe. Okay. Um, so, <coughs> assuming all that's been covered. What I'm seeing at the moment is an uh, AP radiograph from the pelvis um, showing a right sided total hip replacement. Uh, there appears to be some abnormality um, around the prosthesis and it does appear to have sunk in. I would like to see a full uh, length view of the prosthesis and the femur. Okay, good. So, <coughs> got this other view. What do you think? Okay, so uh, she has uh, sustained a Periprocess fracture around uh, the stem of the zoic replacements. Um, yep. The uh, prosthesis is likely to be loose. Um, is it likely or is it loose? Why, why do you think it's loose? Uh, could, well, because the, the medial walls will burn off. So it will be loose. Okay, this loose. Um, how do you classify this? Are you aware of any. <coughs> yeah, so uh, periprocess fractures typically uh, we would use the Vancouver classification. Um, so I think this would be a B3. A B3? What does B3 mean? What is B3? Um, I'm trying to remember that. Um, it, it's a fracture around the prosthesis yeah. um, with loose stem and poor proximal bone stock. Yeah, no, I, I agree. So, 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 so B is when the fracture is <coughs> you know, around the stem, affects the stem. Way. Uh, B1 when it's well fixed, the stem, which isn't the case here. B2 is when it's loose. And B3 when it's loose and you've got poor bone stock. Not necessarily proximal, but you know, you know, proximal fever. I think the bone stock here is reasonable. I don't think it's, it's deficient. So I would say this is B2. Oh, yeah, well done. Uh, David, I know you've done the exam, but tell the guys what's, what's the principles of management here? How do you. How do you so yeah, adequate this. bone stock and a loose stem. Yeah. The idea to be addressed from the stem side would be to obviously reconstruct the uh, proximal canal with a locking plate construct and then consider long stem, usually a long uncemented stem okay. with a metaph metaphyseal fit. So how, how, how long do you go with the stem when you plan this? How, how, how long does it have to be? So you want to assess your distal extent of fracture probably on further imaging and then show that you are three cortical waves or two cortical waves between, between uh, distal to the distal. most distal right. extent. Right. So Iris, how, how do you consent the patient? What are you going to talk about? So you're, you're planning this operation, you're going to do what, what David's talked about, you're going to revise this step. So you go through um, generic and um, procedure specific risks. So you go through uh, generic risks like bleeding, infection, damage to nerves, blood vessels, um, pain, stiffness, scarring, um, and then more specific to this operation, um, there'll be risk of uh, further fracture, malunion, nonunion, um, DVT, actually that's more generic, um, further procedures. It's always talk about leg leg, leg discrepancy in these cases because you know sometimes you have to choose between the length and, and stability. So you end up length. Uh, so, Joe, tell me about the, the operation, what are you going to do? Say you're the hip surgeon, you're, you're planning this, you're in theatre. What's the plan? Uh, it's an appropriately marked and consented patient. Yeah, that's, that's um, all done. Uh, lateral position, yep. antibiotics, tranexamic acid, um, uh, posterior approach uh, to the hip, 
take out the. So tell me about the Coursera approach. How do you how do you uh, how do you do that? What what are your landmarks? Uh, so you're centered over the uh, femur um, and then curving posteriorly uh, onto the buttock, uh, skin, subcutaneous fat down yep. to the fascia, um, splitting the fascia and then more proximally you're heading posteriorly, uh, splitting the fibres. Um, then you're down onto the... <coughs> what muscle are you splitting? The fibre, the first, the first muscle you use uh, after the fascia, big muscle? Glute max. Yeah. Um, and then you're exposing your external rotators um, and taking those off. What structure do you, do you have to... Yeah. So you protect the sciatic nerve. Yeah. Um, so depending on the approach the patients had previously, there may be scar tissue. Um, so just making sure that you're cautious as you do this. Um, taking off the external rotators and stay sutures so that you can repair them later. Um, and then the capsule. And then for the rest of the femur, it's effectively a direct lateral. Um, however distal you need to go. Okay, it's good, great. So this, you've done all that, you've dislocated the hip, uh, and you've explored the fracture. What are you going to do next, what do you think? So take the stem out. Yeah. Try not to propagate the factor, fracture mm -hmm. when doing that. Uh, you can leave the cup in for now. Mm -hmm. You may yeah. not have to revise that. That's reasonable, yeah. Uh, reduce the fracture, if you can get a good fit, you could either put um, cable plus a periprosthetic plate or just a periprosthetic plate. Once you've reconstructed the bone stock, um, then you proceed to revising the stem. Okay. What's really important to do, so you, do, you put your cables up here and you reduce all this. Where else do you need to place the cable before you start? Lower down, so that they basically... Always prophylactic cable down here. Till the distance you, of your stem. Before you start preparing for the stem. Good. Um, who's going to tell us about uh, the stem? What stem are you going to use? Fish carrying up this. So, because it's a paper study fracture and a loose stem, you need a stem with distal fixation, yeah. um, uncemented, so that you don't, it doesn't leak into the fracture side and cause a non-union. Um. Good, that, that's an excellent point. So most hip surgeons would use a distal fix, half a seal fit, modular stem, uncemented. Uh, but there are some centers that use cement. So if you're an exeter, you would get a long cemented stem in this case. But that's crucial to make sure you get anatomical reduction here. Because as you rightly pointed out, if this fracture isn't reduced well, the cement will stop the fracture. You know, you'll end up in the and eventually the stem will fail, will fatigue, it will break. So if you manage to get a brilliant anatomical reduction, then yeah, you can use cement. You know, it's, 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 um, it's, it's not a bad idea. Um, okay, yeah, so, so this lady uh, had this done, exactly what you guys described. So a, a number of cables to uh, reduce the fracture. So reduced nicely and the long stem bypassing the fracture by at least two cortical diameters. So cortical diameters from you know here to here. So we need to make sure. <coughs> you know, uh, Poprosky talks about a minimum of 40 to 50 millimeters, 45 centimeters beyond the fracture if you have a good isthmus. If you don't, they need to think of other fixation devices uh, in addition to your stem. Uh, so yeah, this lady did well, and uh, that's the result. The cup. Uh, I didn't have to revise it because uh, the hip was stable. So you decide on the cup. If, if it's initially you check it before you do anything. If it's loose, there's not worry, any worry about it, then obviously you revise it. If the liner is worn but the cup is well fixed, you can just remove the liner. Uh, this lady had a good cup and a good liner, so I just stick it in. Uh, so just to summarize, the Vancouver classification is a great classification. Do you know why? And, Sarah, do you know why? So, one of the good reasons is that it's easily understandable by other colleagues. Uh, it has set parameters. Um, and it guides treatment. And we, yeah. I mean, that's the great thing about it, because once you classify the fracture, it tells you what you need to do. So, so when the fracture is around the trochanteric region, so that's A. Uh, G stands for greater trochanter, and, and uh, L is lesser trochanter, so A, G, A, L. Uh, in the vast majority of cases, you just treat these unoperatively. Unless the GT is really significantly displaced and, and you know, you're worried about uh, the abductive mechanism, uh, you can just leave it. If you decide to fix it, there are a number of things you can use. I personally use what's called a cold plate. So it's something that grabs the GT and then a cable that goes around the, the, the femur approximately uh, medially. So it holds the extensive mechanism in place. Uh, the B type are the most common ones. Uh, so a fracture that's most of the time it tends to be a, a spiral fracture, so it starts proximally and 
goes distally. Goes distally. Uh, B is subclassified to one, two, three. Uh, B one is when the fracture is in that area, but the stem is well fixed, is solid. Um, B two is when uh, the fracture results in a loose stem, uh, and B three is when the stem is loose and also you've got uh, poor bone stock. And obviously these are managed in you know different ways. I'm going to cover the next slides. And type C is when the fracture is distal to the stem, so you treat it as a as a, an independent fracture. So you forget about the hip replacement. You just deal with the fracture um, uh, on its own. So uh, type A, as I mentioned, uh, it's a uh, this is the claw plate I mentioned. Uh, it's a very useful device. So if you have a fracture in the GT and it's trying to escape, you just uh, use this plate uh, with a cable or, or more, more like one cable, and you can just make sure it stays uh, down. So type B, again, one, two, three. Uh, so B1, stable prosthesis, B2, loose uh, stem, and B3, loose and missing bone. Uh, so in terms of management, the B1s, uh, you tend to fix them. You know, there's no need to revise the stem. It's well fixed, the hip is, unless there's a problem with the hip, uh, you know, from before sustaining the fracture, you just leave, ignore the uh, hip replacement and just fix it. You know, you can use uh, a plate most of the time, a few cables. Sometimes it may be a bit tricky, depending on the type of the stem that's uh, in the fever, it may be difficult to use unicortical screws. So sometimes you might have to accept that you're going to just have cables around the plate proximally with some screws distally. Uh, the B2s, uh, as I mentioned, uh, <coughs> the stem is loose, so the stem's got to come out. Whether it's cemented or uncemented, doesn't matter. Uh, you have to revise the stem. Uh, and the, you know, in terms of technique, uh, like uh, we've just uh, discussed, I like to you know get the stem out, get the cement, remove the cement, then reconstruct the proximal femur, use cables, plates, whatever you need to reconstruct the tube proximally, um, and then uh, uh, use a use a modular and cemented still fixed stem, um, and then you can. Because these stems are really good, the modularity allows you to you know, play with the version, with the offset, with the length, until you get the most stable hip uh, uh, possible. Uh, sometimes you end up lengthening the leg a little bit, my experience with these revision cases, because you're, you're aiming for stability, and sometimes you're just unable to uh, keep the leg lengths equal and the hip stable. Uh, generally speaking, up to one centimeter of lengthening is acceptable most of the time. Uh, and in terms of, uh, in the exam, they'll ask you about how long do you go with your stem. So always remember, the minimum is two cortical diameters. Um, ideally a bit longer, but that's the minimum. Uh, so B3, uh, you've got really deficient bone stock, and uh, you're thinking, um, you know, I need to either bone graft, use strut grafts, or I need to use metal instead of the missing bone. Uh -huh. So these cases are quite challenging and take a bit more planning. Uh, to uh, make sure that you uh, re reconstruct the, the missing bone. Uh, proximal fire replacements, you know, we use them regularly uh, uh, here uh, in this apartment. And, uh, they, uh, they're they a good option when you have uh, very deficient bone bone proximally. Uh, most of the time, these are cemented implants, uh, so you use cement to fix the stem. Uh, and it's, what's really important when you do a proximal fire replacement is that you need to try your best to make sure the, uh, the abductors uh, are attached to the stem. It's a bit challenging because you're trying to get soft tissues to heal onto metal. Uh, you can use all sorts of devices and wires and uh, plates, but uh, the results aren't great uh, most of the time. Vancouver C uh, is when the fracture, as I mentioned, distal to the tip of the stem. Uh, so unless the stem is loose or it's really bad, you don't do anything about it. You just focus on the fracture. And most of the time, you just need a long plate. Uh, I mean, I, this is not a good demonstration, but uh, you need to make sure you don't leave a stress riser, so the plate needs to be longer. It needs to be an overlap with the stem uh, to make sure that you don't end up with an area where there's uh, a young modulus mismatch. You know, you've got a stem and a thick plate and weak one in between. It will eventually fracture, and this can be challenging to deal with. Um, so yeah, this is uh, sorry, fresh a little bit. Any, any questions? Good. So this is uh, another case. Um, who's going to tell us a bit about this x-ray? So this lady is 50. 
she presents to clinic complaining of left hip pain. And she's got a short leg. Um, because, what do you think? Um, um, she's probably got a dysplastic left hip with excessive shortening. Yep. Uh, with the bone impinging on the pelvis, which is causing her pain. So, do, do you think this is this is this is an acute problem, or it's it's a it's a long standing. It's it's been there since birth, but it's obviously become more painful because of the impingement. Yeah, I agree. This is this is a a, um, a hip with a high center of rotation. Uh, so, th this woman is in pain. She's she's struggling. She wants something done. Uh, what do you think? What are the, uh, the so the, the best the option would be a hip replacement, yeah. uh, which would be a fairly complex procedure. Uh, one would have to, ideally, one would want the cup as inferior and as medial as one can get. In her case, uh, we may have to compromise on the position and accept the higher hip <coughs> center. Uh, she will very likely require an osteotomy of the femur to manage to get the hip down to where the cup so is. So before we get into that, so you mentioned, so, so is there, how do you classify this? Is there a classification system that's yeah, aware uh, of? Yeah, pros classification. Pro, okay. <coughs> what, what's that? Can you tell us a bit more about it? Um, so this is a type 4. Yeah, uh, type I, four. I've kind of forgotten about yeah. the, so it's uh, one would be where the the head is pretty much where the cup is, uh, where the acetabulum is, <coughs> two would be subluxed. Three would be dislocated and four is shortened. Right. Not very sure I'll, about I'll, that. Yeah, yeah I'll, I'll, we'll, we'll talk about it later on. So, okay, so this is a crow four, I agree. Um, so, you you decide to do a hip replacement on her. Carl, how, do you, how are you going to plan the hip replacement? Are you gonna, do you need more imaging? Do you uh, yeah, so I think you would, you would like to get some, uh, some additional imaging, a CT scan. Yeah. Uh, the amount of metal work she has since she might cause artifact and may make that planning slightly more challenging. And I think certainly that would be true of an MRI scan as well. But yeah, I think it's in the first instance a CT scan would help for your planning. Okay, so we'll look at bone stock. Uh, so you do a CT scan and it, it shows there's a pseudo acetabulum at the top, where, where our hip is currently. Uh, it's okay, Bob. It's not great. And her native acetabulum is, is just tiny, it's down there. The bone stock isn't great. Uh, well, you, when you do your hip replacement, what are you going to do? Are you? What are the options here? Um, well, I don't have experience with this, but I suppose the options would be to use her native acetabulum, mm -hmm. um, which you said has poor bone stock, so it may not be a good option, or to compromise and use her pseudo acetabulum, um, which is going to result in her having a significantly shortened limb. Um, I'm not sure what would be a preferable option in this instance. So, if you decide to to bring this down to put it back. Where it should be, you know, native, native acetabulum. Um, what are the risks? Um, well, if there is poor bone stock, you risk a, um, a, 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 a fracturing the um, um, acetabulum. Um, you are also going to put a huge amount of pressure on the soft tissues if you're having to lengthen it to that extent. Um, Which structure in particular that you, you wonder about? Does it like to be stretched when it comes to these cases? Speculate the maybe the IT bit, I'm not sure. Sciatica. Yeah. Sciatica, right, okay. So, so when you do these cases, uh, so the right answer is yes to bring the, the hip center of rotation down, the native uh, joints uh, to where it should be. But the risk is that if you stretch it without shortening the femur, you're going to end up with a foot drop. So you, can, you can stretch the sciatic nerve to 2.53 centimeters pushing it. Beyond that, it will end up with a foot drop. So in the exam, they'll ask you about the two options, and the two options are either you go with a high center of rotation, so you put the cup up where it, where, where, where it is now. So this hip has been up there for a very long time. The soft tissues are contracted. Uh, it's an easier operation. Uh, you don't have to do anything in terms of shortening or lengthening. You just go in. You'll have a nice pseudo acetabulum. You can put the cup in. Uh, it's going to be a small-sized cup because the bone stock is deficient up there, but, you know, uh, should get a reasonable fit, and then you just use any stem on the femur. But that's like a primary hip. Uh, I've seen surgeons do, doing it this way, you know, 
they just don't bother with bringing the central rotation down. And patients have a good result. You know? uh, the downside is that the, the <coughs> cup will fail early. Uh, the reactive forces are abnormal up there, and you know, uh, whatever fixation method you use, whether cemented or uncemented, the cup will fail early. So you've got to be prepared to, you know, revise this, especially if it's a young patient you're dealing with, you know, and it becomes harder and harder uh, to, to revise. So you can you can get away with it as a primary hit to, to place a socket up there, but when you're revising it, there's very little bone left up there, so it becomes difficult. Uh, so, so this is what uh, uh, we did. So. Uh, you just bring the uh, central rotation down. So this is the, 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 the option B, you know, in terms of how do you do air replacement. So native central rotation, anatomic. Uh, the challenging uh, parts of the operation are obviously the how much you're going to uh, uh, shorten the femur because you need to make sure you don't end up with a foot drop. So you've got to template for the operation. You've got to decide how much shortening you're going you're gonna to perform. And then this is, as I say, modular distal fix stem. Um, you need to do a subtrochanic osteo osteotomy. So this is the amount of shortening. There's a similar piece of bone on the other side. So you basically split it, just put the bones on the side with, with, with the soft tissue attachments, and then fix the stem distally, and then reconstruct the proximal femur. And uh, as you can see, you need very long screws on the acetabulum to get that good uh, uh, you know, fixation initially. Uh, but then as you can see here, this is a few months down the line, the osteotomy is, is almost healed. Um, the cup is also integrated and you know this lady did well. So uh, this is the crow classification that I mentioned earlier. Uh, so it talks about proximal displacement and femoral head subluxation. Uh, so uh, one, two, three, four. This definitely was a four. Uh, the most severe. Uh, generally speaking in the exam at the FRCS, uh, you're not expected to know these classifications, but if you mention classification, then you need to know it. Uh, I don't know if things have changed now, but uh, if you don't know the classification really well, don't offer it in the exam. Uh, and these are the, uh, the advantages and disadvantages of the cup position. Um, again, there's a, a, a common private question in the exam. You know, um, what are the differences between a high center of rotation and low center of rotation? Uh, so you need to know uh, all of this stuff. But the key is to shorten the femur to make sure you don't end up with a stretching the static nerve too much and ending up with a foot drop. So another periprosthetic fracture. Uh, this is a 65-year-old um, lady. Um, again, she had a well-functioning knee. She's very happy with it. This knee replacement is like 10 years old. Uh, again, she has a she was cycling. Uh, she hit by a car, landed on her knee, um, and. Uh, presents to ED and this is our X-ray. Uh, Neil, what do you think? This is an AG Rodeo Bob, this lady's left um, knee, which yep. shows a total knee replacement in situ. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we should have some concern. There is some boost mm here -hmm. and feminine component and also sometimes with the tibia. I want to see a full length view. What do you think? So do you think this is lucency? What's the slide there? What's this, this line here going all the way up? Oh, it might be, might be a vessel. It is a fracture. So oh, it is a fracture. So if you look, if it's actually in the exam, ask for another view. So you can I see another view? Can I see a lateral? So uh, well, the lateral doesn't help much. <laughs> <laughs> um, Big question. I didn't put the CT. But yeah, so there's, there's, this is loose. I agree with you. But if you look at up here, you know, this is, this is, this is a, a fracture involving the whole medial condyle, like a vertical split. Uh, it's probably the CT is down. Yeah, so uh, I didn't include the CT. So you do a CT, and it shows that the fracture starts here and goes all the way up to uh, the uh, aphasia and aphasia junction. So what are you going to do about this? So this is... Good. So you've established already that the stem is loose, the, uh, yeah. the implant is loose, yeah. and there's a fracture. So do you think this is something you can fix? 
potentially, depending on how high the fracture. But you think you can retain this implant if you, you just said it's loose? Do you no. think it's a good idea to no. fix it? No. No. So you're going to talk about the classification later on, Dave, the rubber classification, but the implant is loose here, so you're thinking I need to revise, revise this. Yeah. But what you're also thinking is that the tibia is well fixed, so is there a way I can maybe retain the tibia and just revise the femur? Um, so, uh, so this is the lateral. Yeah. Sharp, why don't you tell me about, so you decide to revise it, what, what are your thoughts, what kind of implant do you think you're going to need? Um, so you're considering a uh, stem implant for the, for the femur, yeah. similar to that you have in the tibia. Um, the so when you, when you're, if you're examining this patient, what do you need to assess when you're deciding what implant you're going to use? What, what in terms of the range of motion in the... Well, I mean, she's, she's in pain. She's not going to be able to. You're not going to be able to. Do what structure in the knee? The ligaments. Yeah, what ligaments? Try and figure out if it's functional or not. PCL. No, so, so, so the fracture is here. So you need to establish oh, whether. Oh, so you're sorry, sorry, you're really flat. You know, you have an MCL or you don't have an MCL, or you know, why is that important? So, so what's the, what's the difference in terms of? In terms of your deformed forces for the yeah for the fracture. So if there's no MCL, what kind of implant you, you know, do you use? Uh, uh, um, a hinged implant. Yeah. 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 Correct, correct. So if you don't have collaterals, you need to use a hinge. So that's the important. You know the ladder of constraint in your placements? So there's like a ladder you talk about constraint. So uh, it starts from a medial uniconfortmental knee replacement. It goes all the way up to a hinge. Uh, so you need to understand that other exam. So you know, uni, then uh, cruciate retaining primary knee, then posterior stabilized primary knee, then uh, uh, condylar, uh, condylar type constrained knee, uh, LCCK or TC3, you know, whichever uh, company makes them. And then at the top, then you've got a rotating hinge, yeah. and then a fixed hinge, which we don't use anymore. That's a ladder of constraints. So that, and you, you know, your choice of what implant you're going to use is based on a number of factors, but most important thing is bone stock and the ligaments that are still functional around it. So you're actually right, when you don't have a, a, a collateral ligaments, mainly the MCL, then you need to go to a hinge because any other knee uh, implant device will fail. Uh, good, so obviously with these cases in the exam, we always talk about ruling out infection, even if it's trauma, just mention it, but, you know, rule out infection. Uh, so I, I, you know, we, we tried to retain the tibial component here, but it wasn't possible because of the, the fact that this lady needed the hinge. Uh, you're right, you know, the MCL wasn't functional. Uh, so she ended up having a hinged implant um, with stems, bypassing the fracture um, and cement. Um, and <coughs> by using the hinge, you know, you don't need to think about the, 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 the MCL or the, or the uh, lateral ligament the structures because you know that the hinge is going to do all the stabilization for you and it's going to really, uh, uh, mean that the knee is stable and, and uh, functions well. <coughs> so in terms of periprosthetic fractures around the knee, this is not as, as, as well known as the Vancouver classification, but it's a, it's a fairly easy one to, to, to remember and to uh, use and it also guides management. So it's three types, one, two, three, the Aurora Bay classification. Type one is when you have a well-fixed femoral component and an undisplaced fracture. Type 2 is when the femoral component is also well-fixed, but the fracture is slightly displaced. Uh, and then type 3 is when uh, you have a loose femoral component, regardless of the position of the fracture. So the fracture isn't uh, an issue here, it's the fact that the component is loose. Uh, and obviously, because the component is loose, then uh, you're thinking of revising it, as, as, as uh, we did with this, uh, the previous case. Uh, so treatment principles, uh, if you have a well-fixed component and the fracture is really undisplaced, then you can consider non-operative management, uh, brace or caros uh, with, with uh, limited weight bearing for a few weeks. If you decide to operate, then uh, again, the, the type of the classification of the fracture dictates what you're going to do. 
So if it's types 1 and 2, where uh, you have a well-fixed femoral uh, implant, uh, you're trying your best to retain it. So the aim is to fix the fracture. Uh, you've got many options, obviously, to fix uh, these fractures. Um, most of the time, uh, we use plates here at the London. Um, personally, I prefer plates. I think they uh, they give better results. Um, a lot of units use retrograde nails, which is also uh, a reasonable option. Uh, the downside of using a nail, uh, the disadvantages are listed on this slide. So you need to have a cruciate retaining femoral component. So if it's a posterior stabilized, you'll have metal in the way, and you don't have access to distal femur. So the first thing to check if you're thinking of using a nail is, is it a cruciate retaining primary knee replacement? And the answer is yes, then an retrograde nail is an option. Uh, the issues with a nail always is the position of the femoral component dictates the trajectory of the nail. So if you have a component that's flexed or extended, then that's going to affect the entry point in the distal fever and may cause problems improperly in terms of where the nail is trying to go. Uh, the length of the nail might be an issue if you have a hip replacement uh, approximately, so you won't be able to overlap and you may end up with an area, uh, a stress riser essentially that may fracture uh, later on. Uh, a plate is a very good option uh, because most of the time you have enough bone distally to get a few uh, locking screws and then um, and then fix it proximally. Uh, they do well. Um, uh, they deal well as long as the initial reduction is, is adequate. Uh, sometimes, very rarely, you may need to uh, you need, may need to support the medial column as well. So you may need another plate immediately. Uh, but you know, most cases, a lateral plate uh, is more than enough. Uh, with the type 3 uh, fractures, um, similar to the case, I guess, that we have just discussed, uh, you've just got to uh, consider revising the uh, femoral component because it's loose. Uh, so that's a really important thing. And sometimes it's very difficult to uh, ascertain pre-op whether the component is loose or not. So uh, you can get a CT scan to try and uh, uh, see uh, whether the interface is still intact or not. Uh, and in many cases, you make that decision in trial. So it's very important to plan these cases beforehand. So you have everything ready uh, and standby. Uh, you check the implant. If it's loose, then you go straight to a revision. If it's well fixed, you can uh, consider fixing it. Uh, so another case. Um, this is a 16-year-old, um, 16, uh, uh, young girl, uh, uh, old uh, boy who was on his uh, moped, uh, chilling out in East London, and then was uh, <laughs> hit by a police car. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, Presents the ED. Uh, so who's going to tell us about this uh, virus again? Uh, so there's a high energy injury, so you want to assess them um, using ATLS principles. Um, assuming that there's an isolated injury, uh, you would aim to obtain anatomical reduction uh, and fixation of the intracapsular neck being fracture. So it's an isolated injury. Any, anything you want to do to, to assess the limb before you start? Yeah, so neurovascular status. Yep. Um, and you want to get a surgeon who's comfortable, potentially, in opening this to get anatomical reduction. Um, so who should do this and when? What's your answer in the exam? So, so you're, you're dealing with this at 8 p.m. So urgent, but not as an emergency. You want someone who's skilled enough. So the ne first thing the next morning, if you can get a, uh, an arthroplasty surgeon, I think that would be Correct. Question. So you need a, you need a hip trained surgeon, but the, 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 the six hour thing that we used to talk about a few years ago, you do the middle of the night, that's, that's not valid or safe anymore. So exactly. Next available trauma list by an experienced step surgeon. Uh, so talk me through the procedure. How are you gonna how are you gonna deal with this? So you're the hip surgeon. That's what they say for example. You're you're the experienced hip surgeon. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so you initially try close reduction maneuvers. Um, under II guidance, try to get um, as perfect reduction as you can, and if you can't, using various manoeuvres, 
um, then you perform an over reduction by an anterior approach. Um, and once you've reduced the fracture, then you'd fix it with calliated screws. Okay. So that's the lateral on the traction table. So the, the, these images are on the traction. Oh, this is done. This is handy. So on the traction table, uh, closed, you get this AP. So after all the closed reduction maneuvers, you try everything, your rotation, traction, let matter, you name it, this is the best you can do. Um, in a 16 year old. I think this was age, I probably wouldn't accept that. Okay. Um, so I would proceed to the reduction. Good. So who's going to tell us open reduction? Joe, what's, how are you going to do an open reduction? Uh, anterior approach. Okay. Yeah. Why are your landmarks? How do you do anterior approach? Uh, intermuscular plane between sartorius and rectus femoris. Okay. I can't remember that. Bish, can you tell us about anterior approach? Mm -hmm. Who knows? Who knows anterior approach? Who's done it? I did yesterday with the patient. There you go. So a two-two approach, uh, anterior, mm -hmm. anterior mm -hmm. landmarks or your proximal landmarks. Lateral and inferior to your anterior superior LX spine, yeah. inferior landmarks, linear incision towards the lateral border of the patella. Good. Again, you're utilizing your superficial plane between tensor fascia lata and sartorius. In the hooter, you're opening the fascia lateral to TFL Good. and then sneaking into that plane. What's the anteronervous plane? So, just for the guy in the exam, they need uh, femoral and so superficial. Femoral and, yeah, superficial. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So, you know, in the exam, when you're describing approaches for the guys who haven't done the exam, just talk about anteronervous plane. Examiners that will just make sure you always just. So, yeah, I agree. Federal and uh, speak with you. Yeah. Uh, then identify the. So, what structure do you need to try and find, but you don't always. So, the lateral cutaneous nerve yes. of the thigh. Yes, lateral cutaneous nerve. It's really superficial. It's yep. the fascia. Uh, in my experience, um, uh, 20 to 25% of the time when, you, when you're seeing it, when you find it, uh, it won't work post -op. So even if you protect it and you, you know, it's just, uh, your practice is very common. Um, and what's interesting is that women don't seem to mind. It's the men that complain when the, when the nerve stops working because they can't feel what's in their pocket. They come to say, you know, I can't feel my keys, my mobile. You know, women don't seem to mention it. So, so try and find it, but it's not a big deal. You just want the patient that there's a really high chance of you nerves know, working post -op. So Yeah, so so, so, so you, you, you you're, you're between sartorius and uh, uh, TFL. Yep, and then you then you identify the direct head of rectus Good. as it inserts into the AIIS. Yep. Uh, you move that immediately. Good. Identify your circumflex vessels, tie them off. So what's lateral? What muscles are on the lateral side? Okay. Gluteus medius. Yeah, excellent. So medius. Good. And then you find there's the there's one big vessel that you need to look for. It's, uh, yeah, it's, a, it's a branch of the. Uh, uh, you ligate that, and then yeah, great. Then you're looking at capsule, yeah. reflected head, and then the capsule. Uh, of, of, uh, uh, so yeah, what do you do next? So you've, you've exposed the capsule. Uh, so you expose capsule, yep. identify your fracture, uh, open your flaps, take out the hematoma, wash wash it out, and yep. then identify your uh, fracture ends, line up the cortices. And so what tricks, what can you use? Because it's very difficult. You've got this femoral head and neck, and the leg doesn't move much really, it's on traction. So how do you... So most of the time the problem with these is that it's a rotational problem. You, know, you just need to get the right rotation to get the both yeah, sides to, to reduce. Could put, you could put a pin into the... Into yeah, so the I mean, there are many ways. What, what, what I tend to do, I just use two millimeter K wires okay. in, the, in, the, in, the, in the neck and start the joystick. Uh, so some, something like this, um, uh, maybe these are uh, going from the lateral side, but yeah, you just can, uh, because you're operating that air approach, is, you're you know, looking at it from the front, so you can just use one or two, uh, two millimeter K wires and just try and rotate a little bit. Uh, and then you fix from the side, so um, that's what I do. So uh, the patient's supine on the table and then you make an incision laterally and then you can use either a DHS or a 
for cannulated screws. Uh, so you know, th 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 this is better, better reduction than uh, than uh, when when we did it closed. Uh, and then uh, fix it to the DHS and add a rotation screw. Uh, so when you're consenting them, what do you tell them is the risk of um, what, what are the, the complications of this injury? What do you want? What do you tell them? So particularly this, apart from your standard risk, you have high risk avascular necrosis yes. that you need to be mindful of. So AVN is the biggest, um, yeah. the biggest issue. Um, so you need to follow them up for up to a year and get regular x-rays and make sure the fracture doesn't, you know, the fixation doesn't, doesn't fail, doesn't collapse, and that they don't fail. Um, and, um, it's, it's a very useful approach to enter approach, so, uh, and I think it's, uh, it's common to the examiner to ask a lot of things. Uh, I remember when I was preparing for, for the FRCS, there was this, it was controversial at the time whether you, you open up the capsule and, you know, shall be to allow you, you don't, I don't know what the books say nowadays, but um, I, I do that routinely because I agree that you just, um, Makes uh, reduction easier if you uh, go before that hematoma inside the capsule and uh, uh, expose the fracture a bit more. And, uh, make sure you get an anatomical reduction. Um, uh, that's it, guys. Yeah, we just included four cases. Um, <coughs> sorry, it's not a proper presentation, but I'd say it was, it was a last minute. Uh, uh, <coughs> Do you have any questions about these cases or what we talked about? What were you going to say the AVN rate was that you'd quote to a patient for this? So, so what, what dictates that? It's the amount of displacement, of, you know, initially. So every fracture is different. So I, I tend to, I think, in the exam, if you say, you know, anywhere between 50 and 20 percent, I think that's reasonable. I know it sounds high, but that's in reality what happens. Um, but if you, you know, a few studies suggest that if, if, if you fix it, so your job as a surgeon is to get that you know anatomical fixation, and, and um, uh, the ish doesn't need to be as I said you know really uh, uh, done you know urgently. But if you get it done, you know within I reckon 12, 24 hours, uh, and it's fixed well, uh, then you're giving uh, the hip every chance to uh, the fracture to heal, and you know you're trying to salvage the hip, but still uh, sometimes they come back and it's all uh, collapsed and with AVN in the head, so uh, only salvage option then is egg replacement. Um, in some cases, in really young patients, you can talk about doing an osteotomy, depending on the shape of the head, uh, but most of the time it's, it's, it's egg replacement. Uh, which isn't uh, a terrible thing nowadays, because uh, as you know, uh, the highly prostate polyethylene and ceramics, uh, the longevity of egg replacements uh, is much better. Than 10, 15 years ago. So, uh, Prim, Prim uh, uh, does quite a few of these cases every year. Uh, kids with, no, not for fractures, but childhood disorders, you know, the Perthes, um, Skiffies, uh, when they get to you know, the age of 18, 19, 20, they have a way. And, uh, he uses custom made stems for these cases because the shape of the proximal femur tends to be abnormal. Uh, and he's got a good series. Uh, Trying to write it up. Uh, any other questions made about per person? Could we also address this problem with a Wotton Johnson approach? Can you speak up a little bit, okay? Yes. Could we also address um, this problem with a Wotton Johnson approach or the anterior approach is the right answer? Well, no, I mean, you, it depends what you're comfortable with, but uh, in the exam, as in, you know, because I know you're doing the exam as well, I think it's most people will expect you. The idea of this case is, is to get you to solve that tier approach. So in the exam, you're going to figure out when, when you see an X-ray, you're going to think, what are they? What do they want me to talk about? Most of the time, it'll be like a, a purpose. You'll see that in the fracture, you can talk about the plane, the stem you're going to use, but uh, most of the time, they, they'll want you to talk about a, I don't know, a probe or a specific thing about the case. So you try and figure that out to give them, tell them what they want to hear. So the tier approach, I think, is the same. You can talk about what's in Jones. You can, Talk about uh, doing it laterally only. I don't think it's wrong to say that you would uh, you would uh, 
do a Watson Jones. I think it gives you good exposure and it combines both, so it gives you that lateral and anterior uh, uh, exposure. Uh, but how many, like in the UK, we don't do a Watson Jones approach. And you don't want to talk about it in the exam for the first time because they will instantly know that you're uh, talk about something that you've done or something that you know about. Well, I asked about the capsule. Once you come down to the capsule, yeah. right, so which, in which direction do you decide the capsule? So people talk about either a T, an inverted yeah, T, or a H. Yeah. Yeah. So I do, I do a T. I, I find it less traumatic. So a T, inverted T, and just you know, open up. Because you can repair it at the end. So just open up. Just expose the fracture enough to be able to fit that, uh, that reduction accurately. Uh, and then just fix it. Um, most of the time you get, you get a good result, you get a satisfying, because when you're looking at it, in my experience, 90% of the time it's just a rotation of problem. Um, and once you get that rotation, they just, it just clicks at some point. When you start the operation, you're always thinking, oh, I'm going to be here for 10 hours, this is not working. It just goes terribly horrible. And then at some point during the operation, it just starts to kind of want to reduce. Maybe a stupid question, but if they're on a the fracture table, the traction, yeah. uh, so it's traction, you can do this on traction, so you, know, but you need, need to be prepared, so when you talk about setting up before you start, you need to be prepared for anterior pull. So on the traction table, uh, but I don't use the DHS, you know, that big kind of frame on the side, I just use my band, so I just prepare the anterior femur, the thigh and the rest of the leg, and just be prepared. And the traction, you know, if it's too much traction, you can ask the guys to release the traction, you get position, especially when you're trying to be joysticking the, the neck and the, and the head. You may want someone to rotate the neck for you as well. Um, you have to lower the whole table. Oh, lower the whole table. So you, you get someone to just kind of help with that. Uh, but I'd say most of the time you get an adequate reduction. Uh, and then once you do that, you just, uh, you need obviously, you need someone to be with you. You can't do this on your own. So, yeah. so you're holding it with you just on someone from the side with the shoot the K-wires. Which kind of is close for a DHS center and the rotation screw, um, like this case. Uh, generally speaking, I find with, with, with these kind of um, transcervical phases, cervical fractures, I find the DHS to all DHS more stable constructed. I know the spread with screws is better, um, it's a debatable issue, but I just feel a DHS. It's easier to do with screws because you can do a bit of percutaneous too. Um, especially in these cases, you can shoot three screws very quickly from the side. Sammy, you said, um, uh, so well, what Sammy just had said about the classifications, they're not allowed to ask for classifications. However, uh, a common question would be how how would you describe this fracture to a consultant on the telephone? Yeah, yeah uh, true. And in that situation, bring up a classification if you know one. Just because they're not allowed to ask you a classification, doesn't mean you're not allowed to offer them a classification. Okay. If you offer them a classification, be ready to describe a classification. Secondly, you have to remember a different classification for different reasons. Classification for research reasons, classification for descriptive reasons, and classifications for clinical decision making. I think it's really fair game to remember classifications if it's going to guide you on how you manage a fracture uh, or a uh, condition. And bring that up uh, in the exam, and then they'll quiz you, and then you know that that's three marks. Okay? As soon as you start talking about classification, they'll switch you off. They'll shut you down because you know about it. So, just because they won't ask you a classification doesn't mean you can't bring it up. And actually, that's a really good way of demonstrating. Be there before, you know how to describe them, you know how to convey that information to which is what they're looking for. I'm just going to show them that you, you can have a, a discussion as a colleague. <coughs> so, knowing the classification shows that you, know, you can have that grown up discussion with a colleague and talk about management and, and uh, how you're going to make the case. So, no, I, I knew classification, so I did, I did, I did know. Also, the classification for the exam, I didn't for the exam. But when you go on courses, I'm aware people will tell you, oh, you don't need to know them. I, you know, I think it's always better if you, especially the, 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 the 
the ones that you use in practice, practice, like Vancouver. I mean, this one is, is a very common line, really. Uh, uh, but Vancouver is, is a very relevant uh, classification, and I think understanding uh, the classification and uh, how it guides management is very important. Any other questions? You, I think you actually answered it there, but I was going to ask about whether or not you'd routinely close the capsule. So I thought that if you close it, a bit of pressure around the femoral head can reduce the blood supply. Uh, yeah, I, I don't think that's, that's a factor. I, I, I Generally speaking, with any with trauma or hip replacements, knee replacements, well, not really bad, but, you know, anything, anything uh, uh, to do with hip surgery, I close the capsule, I retain the capsule. I, think, you know, I know some people uh, excise it routinely when they do a primary hip, for instance. Uh, uh, personally, I don't think that's a good idea. You know, it's, it's, it's an important structure, and uh, if you uh, approach it properly at the beginning of your case, you can always close it quite nicely at the end, whether it's a trauma case or a hip replacement. So the answer is yes, I always place the capsule. Water top repair.